The European Research Council, ERC, is a structure which has been developed since 2007 as one of the programs of the European, of the um, framework program of the uh, European Commission to support uh, bottom-up, uh, curiosity-driven research and in a very simple program, that is, uh, individual researchers propose an ambitious project which, uh, if it is successful, will be funded for five years and um, so that was really uh, the, the purpose, to have a simple, uh, pro a simple program to support research done by uh, researchers based in, uh, in Europe, which is uh, either in a member of the European Union or an associated country. And the people who receive the grant uh, can be, uh, don't have to be Europeans, they can come from elsewhere. The only obligation is they should be working in a European institution for at least half the time. And the ambition of this is really to really give uh, European researchers uh, the means to develop very ambitious projects in total independence. So that's one of the reasons why the amount of money which is put at disposal of the uh, researchers who are successful um, is pretty substantial. And also the rule is very, very simple. So the, the, the European uh, DERC signs an agreement with a host institution which is going to manage the grant, but all decisions concerning the grant are in the hands of the researcher. So the whole uh, idea was really to empower the researchers and in doing so to really make Europe more attractive to do research. And uh, it seems that this has been successful. Well, actually I'm in a position which is a new one, that is the before that, there was somebody chairing the Scientific Council, which is uh, something very important to mention. That is, the Scientific Council has the full responsibility of deciding how the money which is put in the program is spent, and also the full responsibility of uh, doing the evaluation, how to select the people who are going to receive the grants. And so there is a 22-member uh, uh, council, the Scientific Council, and uh, before the, this year, the, the council would elect somebody as chairman, and the previous chairman was a chairwoman, was uh, Elga Novotny, a sociologist from Austria. But there was also another person who was playing an important role, who was the secretary general of ERC, who was a man, at that time it was a man, who was in charge of the relation between the scientific council on one hand and the agency managing the, um, uh, the European Research Council. And of course, this agency is very important because now at this moment, there are more than 4,300 4, contracts. So you need some people to do the management, also to organize the evaluation. So it's an agency with about 400 people. So these two functions of, of Secretary General on one hand and chairing the council, it was decided to, to merge them. So now there is one person, the president of ERC, and I'm that person, who is in charge of both maintaining the contact with the agency but also chairing the, the council. So my uh, ambition, in a sense, is, is a bit, you, you will find it a bit strange that I say it this way, but uh, ERC has been very successful. So in a sense, uh, already a good ambition is just to make sure that it continues to be as successful as it has been. And uh, of course, uh, one reason why this is uh, already a substantial ambition is the fact that the amount of money available for ERC is fixed. Uh, that's part of the European Commission uh, mechanism, uh, which is the budget is voted for seven years, and we just entered a new uh, period for the budget, uh, so-called Horizon 2020 program. So the budget is fixed from 2014 to 2020. So in a sense, uh, we know how much money we will have at our disposal, and so this will probably not change. Uh, it's a substantial amount of money, but nevertheless, since the programs which uh, in the past have been very successful, need uh, more or less that amount of money. Um, 
a priori continuing what has been done is, is not uh, such a stupid idea. So, of course, we are going to try to improve some things, to maybe develop some uh, variants of what has been done, but more or less uh, already keeping uh, ERC as successful as it is now is already a very, uh, very good uh, ambition. Well, I think it's a paradigm now which has been taken up by a number of countries that is connecting scientific research uh, innovation. Uh, and uh, definitely there is some truth to that. And particularly if one sees a number of the new economic sectors which have developed in the last uh, 30 years, uh, social media, all kinds of uh, variants uh, of uh, high technology, ICT, uh, of course. Uh, so it's definitely, if you look at the, all these sectors, uh, at the basis of these sectors, there were always something, uh, some kind of a new scientific approach or you can talk about biotechnology, the same thing. I mean, definitely sequencing, uh, DNA sequencing has been very basic for development of biotechnologies. So definitely uh, this linkage exists. And, uh, but one tends to forget, so of course, uh, it, it, it is one reason why developing science at the highest level is critical if you really want to play a role in uh, innovation. But this is not enough. So uh, this is indispensable. That's a good, very good reason to support science at the highest level. But at the same time, you need to invent some, uh, some uh, economical model which uh, transforms something which at some point is just uh, some kind of a discovery in uh, knowledge or new uh, dimension of knowledge which has been discovered from a scientific point of view and transform it into an economic activity. And so a typical example is uh, if you take the case of Google, uh, we are all using Google all the time and we feel that we are never giving any money to Google. And Google is a multi-billion uh, operations, huge operation. How does this generate money? It's not clear at all. Of course, it's through advertisement that it does that. And a, a few other activities that uh, Google sells. But for most of the people, the use of Google is free. So how can you make money when you put at disposal of people something which is free? So it shows that besides the initial um, invention of Google, which was really a search engine, which was just a piece of mathematics, um, then uh, there was something else, which was really an economical model. So in a sense, this role of science is absolutely fundamental, but you should not be mistaken. It's not enough to generate innovation and to generate economic activity. So at the same time, the countries who are, uh, I mean, should know that they have to support fundamental science and uh, research uh, at a high level, but at the same time, they have to create the conditions so that these economical models uh, appear, are developed and really successful. So it's this balance which is not so obvious. And a number of uh, countries have understood only part of the message. And they feel that um, actually they, they, they understood part of it and they say, OK, but uh, we have to tell the scientists what they should do so that they do something which is useful for us, which is completely wrong. That's not the way it functions. So this is something which um, is happening in a number of countries that instead of leaving uh, scientists with a full responsibility of deciding what they do, to leave them freedom and to lead them really to develop bottom-up approach, that is scientists making their own proposals, some countries try to really have a top-down approach, namely telling people you should do that. And, uh, but this is a, a very short-sighted uh, view of the way things function. And this is not the way science is going to actually generate the most, uh, uh, the largest impact in the economy. Well, it's always difficult for a Frenchman to, to speak, uh, a French mathematician on top of that, to speak about the position of, uh, of France in, uh, in uh, the general world, uh, I mean, uh, uh, development of uh, mathematical research. I think uh, if you use some objective criteria, say typically this time there was an International Congress of Mathematicians in Seoul this summer, uh, I think the percentage of speakers who were French were 20%, which is completely crazy in a sense because France is just a small country. I mean, if you compare to US, um, many other countries in Europe, you can compare to China or any other country. So clearly it gives a sign. And if you use ERC, I mean, European Research Council, as a measure, I mean, definitely France is number one in uh, receiving ERC grants in mathematics. Of course, not in other disciplines. So from that point of view, I think uh, 
definitely for the moment, uh, mathematicians working in France, I'm using deliberately this expression to mean that some are French, some are non-French. So one of the uh, remarkable um, capacity of uh, France in the last 20 years has been its ability to attract uh, outstanding mathematicians who were not French, sometimes not even trained in France, to come to France and settle in France and work in France. And uh, so, of course, this enhances the, uh, the, the true uh, French mathematicians uh, were also numerous and quite successful. But the combination of the two has been really a, a fantastic uh, success recently. It, it has been in the past, but uh, this period is especially successful. And I think part of it is due to the fact that in the early 90s, Really, uh, I mean, uh, there was really a, a redevelopment, a quite massive redevelopment of employment for young researchers in mathematics in France. That was some kind of a, almost coincidental, but it really happened. Uh, it was really a moment where both there were more positions for people doing research in France altogether, either in universities or in uh, research organizations. But at the same time, a number of positions which had been taken away from mathematicians to develop uh, computer science, and this happened in the 70s, 80s, were given back to the mathematicians. And of course, so there were a flow of new positions which existed for everybody. And on top of that, for the mathematician, there were the extra flow of this position given back. So it created a condition where the young people felt if they were interested in math, that was really the critical condition, they felt they could really develop their career in France as mathematician. And this created this fantastic generation of uh, very talented people, either French or non-French, who are, are working in France now or have been working in France for a long period of time and some of them are leaving now. So I hope some will come back. Well, I, I think I see three challenges. If, uh, the first one is uh, very directly connected to what I just said, namely that France, as many other countries actually, but France specifically, is entering a period where the number of available positions will be much smaller than it used to be before. And the reason for this is general, I mean, austerity, which exists in all European countries, but actually it's not so, so massive in, in a sense in France as in, in other countries, but it is significant. But really the fact that the, the growth of the uh, universities or the research organization happened in the 60s, and it was followed by a period in the 70s where basically nobody was hired. So now the people who were hired in the 60s, I was one of them, have uh, retired. And so for a number of years, there were quite a large number of people retiring. And now we enter the period where the people hired in the 70s will retire. And this number is much smaller. And so as a result, the, um, I mean, the, the, the number of positions available will be much smaller. So this is pure mechanical effect of demography. That was my first reason. The second reason is a phenomenon which also is, doesn't affect France only, which is uh, in many of the developed countries, a pretty uh, sharp decline in the enrollment of young people to study science altogether, and in particular mathematics. And so uh, the number of students in mathematics in France has uh, dropped significantly. And, uh, and also a number of people who could do mathematics, typically well, in France, you know, the system of split system between grandes écoles and uh, universities. So some of them who have been selected on their capacity of doing mathematics and uh, really being student in grande école, they don't see mathematics as a, a place where they would really uh, develop their career later on. So the, the, the lack of uh, people doing math has two dimensions. Uh, first of all, globally, the number of people who study mathematics and among the people who could become mathematicians, actually a number of them became mathematicians. A number of them don't really see uh, the perspective of having a reasonable career there. So that's the second challenge, which is a, a bit specific to France, but really still much broader. Many other countries are facing the same difficulty. The US, it's even worse. I mean, the number of US uh, uh, people, uh, I mean, really Americans who become uh, really mathematicians is very, very small. Most of the people are coming from abroad. And now the last challenge is really the new way mathematics develop, which uh, in a sense, uh, French mathematicians have been very good uh, after a difficult period, but now really very successfully 
uh, gone over this uh, splitting, which happened in many countries between pure and applied mathematicians. So this, um, this uh, schisma, in a sense, uh, is over. You know, we can say it's, it has been forgotten. But I'm not sure that uh, uh, the involvement of French mathematicians in new boundary areas, typically with biology or even with computer science or some other activities which really mix all social sciences, typically big data, for example. Um, I'm not sure the French mathematicians altogether have organized themselves to really be up to the challenge of really uh, having enough uh, mathematicians involved in teams, uh, joining efforts for, say, biology, medicine, or um, computer science, or big data for social, I mean, uh, social sciences and so on. And so I think from that point of view, I think French people have been, uh, partly because they were so successful in uh, traditional mathematics, which could be pure or applied, they didn't feel the necessity to be very aggressive and really embed themselves in, the, in these new domains. And I think it, it's a pity because a number of uh, fantastically interesting uh, new problems are coming from these areas. It also requires some uh, slightly different approach because you have to learn how to work with uh, other people. Uh, with a different language, different uh, practice, different um, time frame also. Mathematicians tend to be slow people. Uh, some other areas just want things uh, to happen all the time. So I think this is the, the third challenge, which I think uh, um, I, would, I would hope that in the coming years, math French mathematicians, uh, when I say French mathematicians, I mean I should say mathematicians working in France, uh, really uh, should uh, accelerate the process and be more involved with this kind of a uh, frontier uh, activities. Well, I think it has been always a challenge uh, for mathematicians to explain what they do. Um, actually, I find that uh, some real progress has been made in this uh, area. Part of the problem initially was, especially in France, very few mathematicians made any effort to try and explain what they were doing and why they were doing it the way they were doing it, which I think is very critical. Um, and so I think uh, times have a bit changed. And so from that point of view, I think enough effort have been made that really now there are many different examples of activities, either touching young people or uh, touching uh, general public. Uh, I myself have been invited to, uh, to, to give a mathematical lecture in a cafe in Paris. It was very nice. People who came were all kinds of people, uh, including people just from the neighborhood. And so I think there have been activities on this. And there are good reasons for mathematicians to really make uh, better understood what is the impact of mathematics in people's daily life. Because actually in the last 20 to 30 years, the uh, impact of uh, mathematical ideas or mathematical, even one can speak of mathematical products that people use, has been growing fantastically. So, uh, so this new, and wh why is this happening? I think there is a very good reason. That is, we are moving towards a knowledge society in some way. That's a typical expression that people use for that. But definitely we are using uh, more intelligent systems. And very, very often, these systems have at their heart uh, some, uh, I mean, really uh, some mathematical uh, piece of mathematics, and sometimes a piece of recent mathematics. So this has to do with all kinds of, uh, uh, I mean, cryptology system, which are embedded in your, when you use your telephone, or uh, all kinds of uh, regular regulation that people are using without knowing. I mean, the, the way the, the planes are going from one place to the other, uh, of course, uh, things which have uh, directly to do with uh, medical imaging, there is always a component which is a mathematical component, next, of course, to something else, which is uh, physics, uh, electronics, uh, and so on. But uh, the, this new phenomenon of uh, embedding a piece of mathematics in many different objects which we are using uh, makes it actually extremely important that mathematicians take the time and make the effort to really try and explain why is mathematics uh, really just uh, uh, really uh, something they, they, they must have an idea about? And so, they, of course, the whole point is not to teach them a course in mathematics, but just make them aware that a number of critical concepts to really make a number of things happen are actually strictly mathematical concepts. They were not designed at all to do what they are doing, but they do it. And um, so I think uh, just today, because I'm at this moment, because of my function at ERC, very keen on uh, following on uh, Nobel Prizes, 
so I, I just looked at various blogs on, uh, on uh, Nobel Prize, and there was one blog I, I read which made me laugh, of course, which is to say, uh, you know, the, it's very explicitly said in the Nobel Prize uh, dedication by Mr. Nobel that uh, it should be given to science which are useful to humanity. And then the man who wrote the blog, clearly very, very aware of mathematics, said that that's a good reason for not having a Nobel Prize in mathematics, which of course is completely stupid. And, uh, but anyway, so that's the image that a number of people carry, which is a completely wrong image, because the people have very often the difficulty of making the bridge between very abstract ideas, which are really at the heart of developing mathematics, and how these very abstract ideas can be embodied into some objects. And so this distance, this uh, leap, is, um, uh, needs explanation, and mathematicians are due to, I mean, have to give this explanation. And of course, you have to do it in a non-technical way, which requires some effort, uh, but you, it's, it's very critical that this be done. So, I hope that the new situation, which, as I said, I think has really improved, and there are good reasons to do it, and a uh, very important reason being uh, that uh, for, for citizens, it's more and more important to really be comfortable with some general ideas on mathematics. They don't have to become mathematicians, it's just that uh, they have to, to really uh, be much more comfortable with the mathematical ideas. So, Typical example is the very, very extended use of statistics now, which uh, people need to be able to spot when people are just misusing statistics. This happens all the time. Uh, many other things like this, where uh, people need to be able to, to, to really spot when uh, mathematics is, is misused, which requires not a technical knowledge, but the basic understanding of how the discipline is functioning. Well, actually, uh, I mean, a special situation with respect to SIEM because I, I was associated with it in some way from uh, uh, very, very early, extremely early, actually. Um, I was uh, here for the inauguration uh, with two ministers, Laurent Fabius and uh, uh, Mr. Defer. So two ministers were present for the inauguration in 1981. At that time, I was uh, chairman of the uh, CNRS Committee for Mathematics. And, uh, and then, um, uh, for a long, long affiliation, I, I was, I think, for 12 years a member of the board. I chaired the board when I was president of the, of the uh, French Mathematical Society, Société Mathématique de France. And uh, there was the idea from the beginning that uh, at least one mathematician should be a long-term member of the board. So the first one was Jean-Louis Cozul, who was the first one to serve 10 years. So then I followed him and uh, was serving the board a number of years. So I've been uh, seeing him uh, transform itself quite substantially and reached a very mature status that it has now. Still needs new developments, but uh, all institutions need to be developed all the time. But now reached really a great international visibility at the beginning. The only purpose of CIEM was to, uh, to copy what the Germans uh, had been doing in Oberwolfau, which was so successful to, and for Germany, very critical to redevelop mathematics in Germany. And so the, really the manifesto to develop CIEM was pour un Oberwolfau français, for a French Oberwolfau. So it was very clear. The model was Oberwolfau, and we wanted to copy it. There was, of course, a little bit of a battle between various sites to host the CIEM. So Siam could have been near to Grenoble, and Jean-Luc Cozul actually would have liked very much. It should be in the Alps rather than near to the sea. But finally, it ended up in Lumini, and uh, so I think uh, definitely now the Siam has uh, fantastic facilities uh, because uh, a great place to, to, to sit. I mean, the environment is uh, very nice, the great library, great staff. So it's um, now really it has. Uh, really reach some kind of a maturity uh, age, and uh, I'm sure it's going to grow further. But it's very visible internationally, so now it's uh, one of the references internationally. So when the countries, more and more countries now consider that it's very important for them, uh, for their mathematical community to have uh, some kind of a, um, a meeting center where people can come uh, on a regular basis and uh, have uh, seminars or, I mean, really uh, workshops for, for one week. And definitely, CM is always quoted as uh, one of the references. Of course, still Oberwolfau is, uh, is still very active. I'm going to leave CM to actually go to Oberwolfau because now I belong to the board of Oberwolfau. So, so I uh, and it's always a pleasure to be in Oberwolfau too. But it's a different style, and uh, but uh, I mean, both of them are 
playing a very critical role for the, in particular for the international cooperation in mathematics, which is so such a uh, very critical element of the development of mathematics.